Welcome to Conscious and Bias LinkedIn Live. Conscious and Bias is an organization that kind of connects up mind and heart to help overcome um, anti-racism and diversity in the workplace. Um, I'm so excited today because we have a special guest, um, Alexis Glick. She's the CEO of Gen Youth, and she's also a Wall Street media contributor. Um, one of the great things about the organization is that they're um, really changing um, society at the grassroots level. And I think um, two things that really stand out to me is one, with, this, with the things that are happening right now with COVID, um, no one's talked about health, right? And how you feed your body and how that um, is actually one of the best ways to fight this disease and also mental well-being and clarity and how you feed yourself actually creates clarity and that actually overcomes some of the, the challenges we're having also on, on racism. Um, we also have Jimena Tanoka, she's a rising high school senior and she's actively involved in Gen Youth as well. Welcome both of you, um, we're so happy to have you. So with so much change going on sweeping through the country and the world, I'd love to start asking, start off by asking you guys to share a sentence on how you're feeling. So who would like to go first? Lena, you go first, babe. <laughs> okay, well, I'd like to start by thanking both of you so much. Um, this is an amazing opportunity and I definitely love, you know, speaking with new people, especially now, Ashish from Consciously Unbiased. Thank you so much. Um, but, Personally, I've had kind of mixed feelings about the world thus far. Um, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. And with all the challenges and the pain that we're inheriting, it's kind of hard to, it's hard to make sense of it all. And although I am confident in our capacity to overcome the situation, um, I'm optimistic for a better world to come. I, I love I love your words. You're always so remarkable. You know, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me and for um, shining a spotlight on the incredible student voice. And you can see when you hear Jimena throughout the rest of this hour, um, you're going to feel more inspired than ever. You know, it's interesting. I, I spend every day talking to students and um, leaders from across the country on a variety of topics, whether it's food insecurity, uh, whether it's race and inequality, whether um, it's the jobless rate. And, you know, I, I would tell you that on many days, it's incredibly sobering. And I feel stuck and in just this extraordinary amount of pain listening to the voices of, in many cases, what I consider to be the voiceless. But all in all, um, what I have learned through this situation, whether it be the pandemic or what we're experiencing um, in the wake of the George Floyd incidents and, and so much more, is I actually feel an enormous amount of hope um, I, I just, it's, it's, an, I feel an extraordinary amount of hope in a way that I might argue I've never felt before. Uh, I think we are uniting in a way that we need to unite. Our voices are rising. And uh, I think we're going to see change like we've never truly been able to see before. And in some ways, I've said to folks that all of this happening during a pandemic, one could argue it's been a blessing and a curse. I see it as a blessing because it's been an opportunity for people to really speak their heart and their mind and to do it in a really profound way. So I guess I would sum myself up by saying I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that great things are going to happen because of this. I definitely agree. I think we're at a tipping point right now where you see society, corporate America, um, the youth all coming together and sort of have, actually having the same mission together, which is so inspiring. So I think with adversity, you always have opportunity. I think we're rising to the moment. Um, you spoke, Alexis, you spoke in your recent meeting article about the youth voices not being heard. Can you talk to me more about this and um, what you think needs to happen? Yeah, you know, you know, as someone who, um, you know, as a mom of four kids, I have kids who are 18, 16, 13, and, and eight, and they got a mouthful to tell me, let me tell you. <laughs> um, but more importantly, it's it's students like Jimena um, and and so many more. You know, the work we do at Gen Youth, we we support 38 million kids across the United States, and uh, we have students like Jimena who are student ambassadors, who are our leaders um, in our work and our program. And you know, in the wake of all the uh, you know, all the uncertainty in the world, whether it be the pandemic, um, whether it be the risk of food insecurity, um, whether it be about food sustainability, uh, there have been so many occasions in which I have said, um, I don't really want to hear from anybody else. I just want to hear from the students. And in particular, in the wake of the George Floyd uh, incident, I, 
I, for the first couple of days, I was sort of, I was um, paralyzed is the best way to describe it. And over that first weekend, I, I just was in so much angst and so much pain over what to do. And my first inclination was not, let's get on a phone with the governor. Let's not get on the phone with our partners at the federal level. Let's not get on a phone with, you know, five CEOs. I wanted to hear the students. And the first thing that our students said to uh, to me that that Monday, it had just been one week, is let us speak. And I think as an organization that whose mission is to uplift and raise the student voice, their voices are more critical than ever. And what makes me um, passionate and sometimes furious and a little bit angry is that, um, you know, students say, and this is just the, the truest way to describe it, if it's about me, don't do it without me. Well, it's about their future. So why would we do it without them? Um, and I feel like we need to include them in this conversation in an incredibly profound way. And I feel for too long their voices have not been heard. And so I, I just know from my point of view, I'm going to change that. And I'm so grateful to you that you're you know, allowing us to do this together because I think the more we lift their voices, the more we're going to see real sustainable change. And these are the students who we tell them, you know, you want to create the change you want to see in the world? Well, we know a great leader who did that, you know, decades ago, right? Uh, he yeah. said some profound things. And I think this generation has some profound plans for what they see the future uh, to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you agree with this, but when I was 18, I felt like I was at the top of my game. I was using my brain the most, right? I was in the best shape. I was thinking clear. No one, no one had input on how things have to be. And so I had ideas. I'm sure your kids are always telling you, mom, this has to happen this way. And this, and so the clarity of that actually creates opportunity. And they probably have ideas that we can't actually think of today because we're used to what's already been life coming at us and like reacting to that. Um, Jimena, what are your thoughts? Around that? I think this is a time where we're shifting the entire world. You know, we're in the midst of a pandemic. And on top of that, we're having so many things thrown at us at once that it's a time where we can't, you know, kind of push anyone out. It's a time where we all have to consider every single person that is being affected by really everything that's going on. So I think it's so important and crucial that we kind of look at everybody, you know, the big industry professionals, the CEOs, the, you know, the kids, it's everyone all at the same time. It's not, some people versus others it's everyone so i think it's so important that we all come together understand each other and work towards making a better world Definitely. what are your feelings about the protests that are happening right now um so i think this is a time when you know due to our connectivity we're constantly exposed to um societal societal happenings and it's honestly, more than other generations before us, especially with the situation with COVID-19. You know, everyone's home. There's not really much else to do but to be on social media. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we surround ourselves based on the content of our heart. You know, we look at people and we consider whether they should be a part of their life, of our lives, based on who they are. And we also take on elements of a ton of different cultures. So I think that young people are very angry and frustrated that a person be can become fixated on something so trivial as the amount of melanin in a person's skin. They're angry and frustrated that it's so hard to ask for equality for some who are considered family. Whilst, I mean, it's just, while we understand that you know, violence is never the answer. It's not really gonna help lead the charge in a positive way. We also acknowledge that protesting systematic injustice is not an easy task. And despite the nature of the cause, you know, it's trying to ask for equality. There will always be rejection when attempting to make changes to the socio-cultural system. Feeling strongly about equality is not a hobby. It's something that students carry with them through all aspects of life. And therefore, the impact of the changes that we see coming will be present in the minds of every student in every school. Well said. 
And so you look at the process. I know because a lot of people sort of try to say the riots are um, an offshoot of the protest, but I actually kind of feel like they're, a, they're people to be opportunists to take advantage of a situation where that's out there, but that's not the message that's happening. And it's a very small minority. So I'm glad that, that you feel that way as well. Um, Alexis, can you share a little bit about Gen Eats mission and um, how it started, what it's doing now and um, where it's evolving to? Well, you know, um, Jimena, I mean, you just, I'm smiling because I feel like you're like my daughter, or, you know, this is like crazy. Um, I got, I've already got too many of them, but um, <laughs> the way she speaks, right? So beautifully. And it's just so from the heart. And so I so appreciate what you're saying about the protests. And I think, you know, when I look at Gen Youth, um, our, our true north is we create healthier school communities. And and we do that uh, by empowering those 38 million kids that we support every day in you know, about 75,000 of our nation's schools. Our real focus is, um, is, is truly on how do we set Jimena um, and students like her up for success. You know, we, we often say we, we want to give them a world where they can be healthy, high-achieving youth. If you already see, they're already healthy, high-achieving youth. But our focus is truly on giving school buildings the resources that they need for kids to get access to healthy meals, um, to have an opportunity to be active for up to 60 minutes a day, really to make sure that they're set up for the health and well-being. And um, and for kids 13 plus, because we work in school buildings K through 12, we have a social entrepreneurship program called Adventure Capital, where we ask them to tackle real world challenges, just like the ones you're facing right now. And, um, and they do it by creating business plans and solutions that they can essentially uh, get up and running in their school buildings and their communities to create a healthier school community. So I, you know, from our vantage point, I think at Gen Youth, we are the largest health and wellness program in schools in the United States. But from our vantage point, particularly at a moment like this, our focus has been on food insecurity. You know, number one, what are we doing to ensure that that no kid goes hungry, to ensure that the meals that are delivered in the school building are getting to those kids and families at a particular time of need. Um, and then number two, what are the other resources like physical activity, equipment, um, or resources to help students um, succeed in the classroom and later on in life that we can provide the school building? So our belief, um, and I think this, I think this is the, the real reality that we've learned in being in school buildings over the past decade is that you know, school buildings are ground zero in America. They're ground zero for hungry kids. They're ground zero for where you learn and grow. Um, and at the end of the day, they're the great equalizer. And that's the beauty. You know, when I look at what's happened in the past couple of weeks, I, 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 I think to myself, wow, not enough people in America understand that the minority is the majority in U.S. public schools in America. Um, and so what some and our elder classmen, I consider myself a kid. I'm, I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor here in case anybody's like looking at me. I'm like a child. But, um, whether, or I'm wearing overalls, as Amanda knows, on the weekends. Um, but I, I just I can never take the kid out of me. And because I'm around them and I, I'm, I see and hear their voices all the time, I guess I just that's probably why I have such a different perspective on what I think the future looks like, because I see it every single day in America's schools. And it looks a lot different than the older generation, I guess. Definitely. I love that like when this when COVID started, and all these kids were at home and like a lot of them get their meals from going to school that you guys mobilized and actually helped distribute that and raise a lot of funds. Could you talk to us about that a little bit? And also, if somebody in the audience wants to donate and help, um, provide food to, to kids at home, how would they do that with your organization? Oh, I love you for asking. You know, um, look, very simply put, um, as I mentioned before, we support, um, our, our programs exist in about 80% um, of our nation's schools or about 75,000 U.S. school buildings. But when the pandemic started at the very beginning and when Seattle started to go shelter in place, we had this terrible feeling um, in, our, in the pit of our stomach because we know that from working in schools across the United States that prior to the pandemic, 30 million kids a day rely on school meals for their daily nutrition. And we recognize that when Seattle went shelter in place, if that was going to have a domino effect across the rest of the country, we were going to see something that we've never seen in American history. And frankly, the notion that uh, at one point, you know, just a couple weeks ago, 124,000 U.S. school buildings were closed uh, was a huge, huge historic moment in our history. But the reality was that nine out of 10 U.S. school buildings continue to feed America's kids. 
And that's because not just 30 of the 50 million kids who attend public schools each day rely on those school meals, but now in a world in which we have you know, almost 50 million people have filed for jobless claim. That number is growing and escalating a rate that we've never seen before. So what we did is we created an emergency school nutrition fund. Essentially, the way it works is school buildings still receive the food from the U.S. government uh, as a part of a partnership with USDA, which oversees school meals, U.S. Department of Agriculture. The problem is the meals get to the cafeteria. And to serve those meals out in a non-congregating way, they've got to move them to a grab-and-go model, either into parking lots or into school buses. We have school bus drivers who are delivering meals to kids in costumes. I mean, some extraordinary measures. But the reality is the equipment that takes that meal out of the cafeteria onto the bus or to the parking lot, whether that's cooler bags, whether it's grab-and-go containers, whether it's the PPE, the protective equipment or the sanitary equipment, that's what we've been providing school buildings. We've been giving them a, a $3,000, up to $3,000 worth of a grant to purchase those pieces of equipment to ensure the safe delivery of those meals. We have over 12,000 US public school buildings that have still requested funds. We've been able to support 7,000 schools thus far, but we still sit here today with over 30 million in requests from school buildings. And the truth of the matter is, given the CDC guidelines for how school meals will be served in the fall, this equipment is going to become even more crucial because the recommendation is that no meals be served in the cafeteria, but be served in the classroom. So as we sit here today, we expect that what we were seeing from about 12,000 schools could easily triple, if not quadruple, uh, in, in the coming weeks and months. Now, if anyone would like to help us, which we would be incredibly grateful, since, as I said, we have an over $30 million deficit right now, you can do that by either going to genyouthnow.org uh, to our website, or folks can text to donate. We have a text to donate. Um, you just text um, 20222, and you type in the word schools, and um, we'd, be great. we'd be grateful for any help we can get. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you for all you do. Jimena, how are you feeling about the racism right now? And, and also just working, working from home or studying from home, like how has it affected you personally? Well, I'm an immigrant and I'm Hispanic and I live in, a, in an area with a significant Hispanic population. And either from my own eyes or from the eyes of others, I've experienced issues such as racism and you know discrimination. And despite my school being small and diverse, I still have been the recipient of micro racism, whether in the form of a joke or political opinions. And it's difficult to understand that your peers attack you not for what you do or who you are, but rather just a part of you. You know, it's not, it really makes you wonder why they come to that conclusion or why they think that. So, Personally, I aim to try and understand the person's entire thought process and offer a different perspective. I think that you need to be ready and willing to enter into difficult conversations and set aside your emotional reactions. You know, you can't have a reaction to what they're saying because immediately everything turns into an argument and it really shouldn't turn into that. It should be an opportunity to instill a more tolerant mindset in others around you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was interesting. So when I posted that we were doing the session together, I was really surprised that you're actually on LinkedIn and you posted something back. So <laughs> companies should be aware that um, your generation is really already watching us, right, on every platform. And so what we do and how we do it as organizations um, can affect how we grow as organizations in the future. And so I think it's really important for everyone to understand that because I was shocked and then you told me when we were talking beforehand that like, half your friends are now connecting with you on LinkedIn and you were surprised. Um, in terms of uh, changing things, how do you think that we should approach this um, from your standpoint? I think the first step to making any concrete change starts within us. So I think it's everybody's responsibility to get informed, to change their mindset, to understand others from not just who we perceive them to be, but who they are. You know, in this fast paced world, we quickly kind of categorize people into who we think they are or who we see them as. 
But really what we should be doing is taking the time to truly get to know someone for who they are. And I think it starts there. That's That should be our first goal. And from there, we can work on getting together, organizing ourselves to make real positive change for the communities that need it. Absolutely. Alexis, from your standpoint, um, I noticed your background is from a lot of different areas and you grew up um, in, in outside of New York City, right? Is that correct? I well, you know, I, I grew up, I actually grew up in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in, uh, I, I call it the concrete jungle. So I grew up in a place called Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper, uh, which was for returning World War II vets. And we were all, you know, essentially blue collar families. I mean, my, I, I came from a family where, um, you know, my mom didn't go to college. My, my dad was the first of his generation to go to college. Um, and, uh, and, you know, um, we really grew up in the Americana, the immigrant America. You know, um, my father's his dual citizenship, his Irish and American citizenship. And, uh, you know, I was taught my whole life. It's so interesting when I listen to Jimena um, because all I know is this notion of don't judge a book by its cover. And, um, and it's been interesting listening to the students because I've watched students tiptoe in some ways around like, what's the right thing to say? You know, a lot of kids have said, you know, well, I've grown up being colorblind or I didn't know the difference. And and they're afraid to say those things right now. They're afraid of the pain of, of what that um, could mean to someone else. And and I keep saying, you know, it just comes from the heart and you can hear it from Jimena. Um, you can hear the wanting to understand. I. I often teach my team. I've, I've been doing this throughout my career because I've, I'm sort of the kid who, um, I actually, you know, interestingly enough, it's a sort of a scary thing. But I say to folks that when I was younger, um, my mom was a secretary um, in, in the business world, and I watched this movie called Trading Places. Um, and it was the first movie. It's not a movie that Amanda will probably have seen, but you'll know it, right? Um, and it's a story about how. Um, essentially, this white guy was treated. He was a commodities trader, and then they did an experiment on um, on a, a black guy named Eddie Murphy at the time um, to see if he could do the same job or as good, or if not better, uh, than uh, than a you know another guy named Dan Aykroyd. Um, and in any event, um, it was that movie that actually sort of changed my view and trajectory of what I wanted to do. Um, and my first career was actually on Wall Street before ultimately going into media and now philanthropy. I think the thing I would just say that I've shared with folks throughout my career, it's probably, I've said to people, there's sort of two things that have kind of layered through every career decision I've made. Uh, one is wanting to be on the foul line with three seconds left in the game and just enjoying the pressure. Um, and so to me, I know I wrote a uh, I wrote an op-ed uh, a couple of weeks ago um, on the George Floyd incident um, and talked about how it impacted me. And I knew when I wrote it that um, there were going to be an awful lot of people who were probably pissed off that I was so vocal about why I was so angry. Um, yeah. And I didn't really give a crap uh, because the truth of the matter is that's who I am, and I'm not going to be something I'm not. And this is the way I've grown up. Um, and you know this. Second thread, I guess, is that um, I've spent my entire life trying to understand people's pain points, and it's something. If you if you if you're around my team, um, they'll tell you they're like, okay, Alexis wants us to understand the pain point. And what do I mean by the pain point? It's what people don't say. And so when it, whether I'm going into uh, a deal and I'm doing a deal in the business world, or whether I'm you know meeting with someone. Uh, as it relates to the philanthropy to, to, to you know, to see if they're willing to um, invest and support our work in, in school buildings and communities across the country. I'm always looking for what they're not saying. And, and what I tell students, and I think this is going to be very, very much the case when we return back to school in the fall and whatever that looks like, because it, it will not be normal, is I want you to look for what students are not saying, because it's what they're not saying that you've got to peel back the layers and peel back the onion on. Because what they're not saying is their, their quiet place of fear. And if you can understand someone else's pain points, you can help solve problems, not just for them, but the two of you can communicate in a way that you wouldn't otherwise communicate. And to me, that has just been so essential to my entire life. You know, it's, you, know you just said it a moment ago, men in this generation are teaching 
the business community in particular right now, what it means to not just stand for something, but to do something. They don't want you to just stand for something. They don't want talk. They want action. They not only want action, they expect action. And if you're not going to act and you're not going to truly practice what you preach, you're not going to have their respect. You're not going to have their voice and you're not going to have their willingness to participate in the conversations with you. You've got to actually do something with the knowledge that you are gaining from them. And so to me, I think what Jimena is naturally saying is understanding each other's perspectives should be such a common core and a common value of who we are. That is the greatness of America. It's the greatness of the fact that the minority is the majority in American schools. Why aren't we doing that in a more profound way? Why aren't we doing that in the workforce? We should be doing that on television. We should be having the conversations on a much more robust playing field, which is what, frankly, you're doing here at Consciously Unbiased. Thank you. And they also want to have your business if you don't do this, right? So one of the things I love about your history is that you've always pretty much um, tackled that I call this curiosity versus fear of the unknown. And if you let curiosity win, you overcome racism and bias. Um, as an adult, because I think your um, generation is going to do this, but how do we reteach or change people's mindsets that are Let's say my age, right? Because I'm our generation right now is empowered. Eventually, the power is going to go to the next generation. But to help that facilitate and that move that forward, because if you look at all the riots and all the protests and stuff right now, it's a resistance of power because they think for you to give somebody who's a minority power means I have to lose some power, right? And it doesn't have to be that way. It can actually be just make the circle bigger for all of us. So how do you sort of push that across um, our age group? You know, um, I'll tell you a couple things um, and. It's, it's been fascinating because it's it, in, particularly in the wake of the pandemic, it's taught us a lot about one another. And um, I have had some, some of the deepest conversations I've, I've had with folks uh, that I've ever had. I've actually even told our students to reach out to people who they never thought they would otherwise have an opportunity to speak to because people have something really rare right now and that's time. And time is the most precious commodity. And you know, it's, it's something we take for granted and yet what this moment is teaching us is that when we live in isolation, as we've been forced to do, we miss human contact. Mm -hmm. um, human, our, it's in our nature to want to be with one another, to want to band together, to want to conquer together. And when we don't have each other, feeling isolated is a terrible feeling. And guess what? I believe God does things for a reason. And I believe that this isolation is going to teach people what it might be like to be that isolated student when you are the only black student in a room full of 25 white kids. And I think we need to learn something from this isolation that we may not have otherwise experienced. I do believe that God's teaching us, um, unfortunately, a lesson in which we've lost far too many lives, but we've also taken too many liberties, whether it's our climate, whether it's how we treat one another, whether it's, I mean, the thing I, you know, I'm sorry, but the thing I, it, it killed me. I couldn't get over eight minutes and 46 seconds. Um, in my, in my mind, the immediate reason I couldn't get over it is because I kept saying to myself, you know, all our lives we teach children from the earliest ages, you know, whether it's hide and seek or learning their numbers, we always say like, oh, one Mississippi, to Mississippi, like we tell them to slow down when they're counting. And then you think to yourself, 526 seconds. That's 526 seconds. That's unconscionable. How could that actually happen, 526 seconds? And to me, I guess my advice right now to the adult world is a combination of three things. Um, number one, you gotta look at yourself. You gotta ask yourself, where are you um, maybe consciously biased without even knowing that you are consciously biased. And what do you need to do to become unconsciously biased? So you have to ask yourself that question. If you're walking down the street and you see someone across the street, do you naturally assume that if they have a different color skin that you should be afraid? Is that is that a bias? So number one, I think we have to look within ourselves. Number two, um, I know that a lot of folks have said, get smarter, read more, um, watch more um, films. You know, a lot of the students have said, Alexa, 
Netflix. Look at what Amazon's doing. Well, look at what Netflix is doing. Um, look at how folks are giving us more resources and availability. We've also had students who have said to us, Alexis, why, you know, we have Black History Month. And I said, yeah, does that bother you? Yes, it bothers me. I said, okay, do you want to make sure that it's Black History Month every month? Yeah, well, why don't we do that? Who's stopping us? So why don't we rethink, you know, when you go to school, you don't study American history for a month. You study American history. So let's study black history every month. So I think the second thing I would say is we can educate ourselves, but we can change how we're taught. And that's one of the things I'm gonna fight really hard for with our students. I want every educator in America to look at the way we teach African-American history and rethink how we teach black history month or any other race that is a part of this great fabric called the United States of America. Um, so that's number two. And I think number three is I want adults to listen to Jimena. I am going to do this until I am blue in the face because you need to hear her voice. That is the future. And you want to hand the future off to a generation that are not just the leaders of tomorrow. They are the leaders of today. So in my case, I've turned over my social media channels. Every Thursday, I'm turning over my social media channels to a student. I've been able to get a handful of other incredible leaders to do the same. I would love for you to join me. Um, and I would love for any of those who are influencers who are listening to this right now to say, you know what, Alexis, I'm going to join you. I'd love to have one of your students join me on a Thursday and share their voice. Because we as older adults are only going to get smarter about how we address these issues. If we listen to the voice of students, they are the leaders of today. Absolutely, very well said. And then what would you like, to t what would you like adults to t ask you for? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, the audio is. What would you like your adult adults to ask you for in terms of advice and how can they, how can they help you better? I think that it goes back to understanding how students feel. You know, if we can understand how students feel and what they think about situations, we can think about what steps to take in terms of making real influential change. And I think that starts with um, looking at everything, you know, a student's life, every part of their life and evaluating, you know, what aspects are working and what aspects aren't what aspects need help or improvement and which aspects you know are being overlooked i think it starts with you know hearing students seeing them and understanding why they feel certain ways i think if we can start with that then we can go about making actual change and really helping communities across the nation get better I love that. Um, is there any other things you guys want to add to this or questions that you have? Is that to us? Yes. Oh, you know, <laughs> I keep the form open so we're both sort of coming up with things. Yeah, no, no. I, you know, I mean, I think, you know, the, um, it's interesting when I think about gen youth and our role is creating healthier school communities and, um, I think the thing I would say to you, when I mentioned earlier that school buildings are the great equalizer in America, right? No matter who you are, where you come from, you step in that school building and you're on a level playing field. And I think that we need to think a lot harder about how we create healthier school communities, right? Um, and, and that means creating healthier communities. You know, um, I've watched the reaction among, um, among students. I've watched the protests. I, I believe that our voices need to be heard and that's why we have this thing called protesting in America. Um, and we can't paint a brush when we see some who take it um, to the extreme. Uh, yet that breaks my heart because there are plenty who want to protest for all the right reasons. It's the same reason when you see one police officer make a, a catastrophic, um, uh, catastrophically bad decision. It doesn't mean all police officers um, are not doing, uh, in many cases, some of the best work possible to make us feel safe in our cities across this country. But I think the, where it starts, right, is the community level. And I think that's what you've heard, um, whether, you know, it's the former president um, or some of the, you know, some of the uh, you know, greatest local leaders. The thing that I've loved seeing the country do is have 
a conversation right now. And that conversation to really affect change, you've got to affect it at the local level. One of the things I say to our students all the time is the domino effect that each one of them can have, right? It just takes one adult who isn't willing to invest in one kid. It takes one kid in one school building to create a healthier school community that it can have an, a domino effect on the average school size is 550 kids. At the high school level, it's thousands. Imagine the domino effect they can have in their school building or community. So I would, you know, I would embolden us to say, how do we really create healthier school communities? And part of that is making sure that no one goes hungry, whether you're a kid or an adult, right? So what's the fabric of the safety net right now in a world in which we have so many people out of work? Number two, as it relates to race and inequality, it's how do we have a real conversation? And, and it's going to be raw and at times incredibly painful, but it should be happening at the local level. And number three, there's all the mental health effects of both what has happened to our way of life due to the pandemic um, and, and the mental health implications of what it has felt like in Jimena's point um, to have been a kid who's labeled something or who's walked in a room and felt like, are people looking at me different? I mean, there's the mental health aspects of that, that that I've seen our kids carry with now for years. I've heard students say, you know, Alexis, when I go somewhere with my dad, um, you know, because of the color of his skin, I don't feel as safe when I step in the school building or I'm worried about him when he leaves the door. But my mom, because she's white, I can go anywhere and, I, and I'm not labeled or questioned. Well, what are, like, that's unconscionable. Like that needs to stop immediately. What are we thinking? Um, so to me, I think we've got to really look at our local communities and say, how do we start to have those conversations? So it's not just healthier school buildings, it's healthier school communities, because all of what we're doing largely is wrapped around school buildings, whether it's where you go to vote, whether it's where you go to feed people, whether it's where you go to educate kids, that's really the fabric of this country. Absolutely. One of the things, um, Himana, you mentioned early on, so which caught my attention is when we do training with our clients, um, we talk about um, micro progressions. And so the idea is that you sort of build habits by actually checking yourself on certain things you do. So one of the things I did, I tend to used to do was um, cut people off during the conversation. And the message that sends is that I don't care what you're saying, or it's not important to me, or I'm thinking about what I'm going to say instead of hearing what you're saying, right? And so I've checked myself, and so I, I make sure that I let people finish their conversation before I do that. Um, and so that shows value. And then another one that you mentioned early, which we've been talking about with clients now, is that if somebody tells you a racist joke and you laugh, right? One, you're giving them permission to continue that behavior. And if you don't do, and if and the second thing is, on some level, you kind of think it's funny because there's some truth to it, right? So if you don't laugh, then what you've done is you've made that person know it's not okay, but you're also subconsciously programming yourself to get over that microaggression as well. You know, and so I think um, that was a really great point that you brought up in the beginning. So if you have any other microaggression ideas, I'd love to hear them. Absolutely. I will email you, but okay. um, one quick one that I thought of just now is, you know, we see a ton of apps that are like, exercising and training and you know you have to stay on top of the app either to you know stay with your schedule for fitness or for healthy eating so what if there was a way to turn that you know checking yourself into a kind of app that you stay on top of you know yeah. you check in every once in a while to like make sure you're making progress and that way it's accessible to everyone everyone can be on it all the time and it's right there you know it's placed in a format that we're already familiar with so it's just you know adding another app on your phone yeah i love that idea um what's your biggest hope for gen z in the future so my biggest hope for gen z is that we redefine the building blocks of society you know i'm convinced that it's possible to be successful in any industry and at the same time be considered be considerate of the betterment of society that institutions be aimed at helping generations helping generations and people grow and strive for better futures for the generations to come you know not just us but like who's going to be after us you know thinking about them 
and setting up a world that is going to be optimal for them to be considerate of themselves and also the world as a whole, you know, not just people, but our earth. And um, I would like to look around in 10 years and see that my generation has accomplished a more knowledgeable and embracing society centered around the merit and goodness of a character working together to better the earth and the people who lived on it. Very well said. So, she has, oh my God, this is so bad. I love you so much. So, um, oh my God, do, do, do we think she should be running for president? Okay, um, <laughs> that's, that's next, it's on the agenda. Um, so I, it, it's interesting, you know, I'll tell you something. Um, so I have this sort of checkered background and uh, I've done a handful of things in my career, but you know, I'll tell you the, the most interesting thing that I've found about this experience is that um, my partners in this effort uh, at Gen Youth, it stemmed from a partnership between America's dairy farmers and believe it or not, the NFL um, and, and NFL players. And mm -hmm. I just wanna share why that matters to Gen Z for a moment. Um, I remember when I first met these folks and they were putting together this philanthropy and it was a partnership between America's dairy farmers and the national football league. And I'm like, um, I, how does that, like, how does that work? And I remember going in to meet with them in the very beginning. And I'm, I jokingly say to folks, I'm a man in a woman's body because I'm a sportsaholic and I'm, I watch sports like live all the time. I mean, I go to Vegas for fights or something wrong with me. So, so but, um, <laughs> I, I'm literally like I know more about football than I should, but anyway, but um, but I also because I have worked on Wall Street and I have worked in media, I um knew what was happening with the plight of America's dairy farmers, particularly back in the 0708 depths of the recession, and I become very very close to farmers, and um and you know, I just I just I I can't describe it, but when you when you've met someone and you see them and you see their hard work and their work ethic and their um, their way of life, you learn so many valuable lessons. And it's been fascinating to me watching what we've been witnessing. And in part, I say that because when I look at the two groups that feel so deeply passionate about where we are in the world and wanting to change it, um, I look at the players. Right? Look at what the NFL players have done, and those players have been the uh, reward for kids adopting healthy behaviors in schools that we've helped share. We've asked players to come into school buildings with us to really help uh, kids understand what, what does it mean to be healthy, high achieving? What does it mean to be physically active in the off season or to eat healthy to fuel your body in the right way? Um, and it's interestingly enough, you know, as we've gone through this over the last two, three weeks, right? The voice that you've heard is the voice of the players. And I often say to folks, you know, we've got NFL players who um, who do the most miraculous things every week in America, every week. I mean, there's 1,600 active NFL players. We have alumni and active players who come in and talk to kids and no one knows about it. No one knows about it. It's this hidden gem. It's a secret because they're the pillars in their community. And then I look at my other partner, America's Dairy Farmers, and I was on a call the other day with some folks that I work with uh, uh, in the, the farming industry. And and they said, uh, you know, Alexis, like, you know, uh, what do you think? And I said, what do I think? I think I think what you guys have done is remarkable. And they said, well, why? We, we feel like we're not doing enough. I said, you're not doing enough. Are, are you, you have not only been the, my first phone call to get resources into school buildings and you've, you've, you've stepped in immediately. Number two, if there's anyone in this country who understands what it is like to have to go day to day not knowing, can I feed my family? Will my commodity costs rise so much that I can't produce on the farm? Who live with the notion of will global trade seize up or not? Will I be able to feed my family? Will I be able to do, am I resilient enough to wake up the next day and be able to manage the farm? I mean, the consequences of what our farmers have been living through for decades in America, not just what they've been through in the last couple of years. And I look at their resilience, their commitment to this next generation, their passion for their land, for their animals, for this next generation of kids. And I go, oh my goodness, they understand better than anyone 
why we want to embolden this next generation to be the leaders of today. And so I say that to you simply because when I look at the work I do with corporate America, uh, the work I do with foundations in specific industries or the folks that I know in the media world, I, I sometimes say, you know, it, sometimes it's the most unlikely of, of suspects that when they come together, they create magic. And I remember stepping into that room 10 years ago and going, NFL and players and teams with farmers, like how does that work together? And the reason it works together is because that's the fabric of this nation. Mm -hmm. And these are people who are quietly doing things because if I were that NFL player in that local community and I didn't get my chance, this chance, that game may have been the reason I got out of my community and had an opportunity to now use my platform to create good in the world. And if I'm that local farmer and I've spent my entire life worrying about how I'm going to nourish this next generation, then I care what's happening to these kids. I want Gen Z to be in the position of power to go out and lead. And so I think sometimes we forget as adults that there are pockets of this community, there are pockets of adults who've been living this, who've been fighting for this dream, who understand as good as anyone why this generation is going to do things that we never dream possible and why they are so invested in them now because they've seen what they're capable of just from having done it themselves in these small corners of the country year after year after year. So I love how you took two completely different audiences and put them together and said, let's focus on our commonalities, our differences, and let's make an impact together, right? Because Farmers and football players. I know that a lot of farmers do want to become football players, but reality is that culturally they're very different. And so it's amazing to see that in, in practice, you know, because I think that's really how we overcome all the things we're doing today is like inviting everyone to the party and making sure that everyone contributes and forces to the same go towards the same goal. And that's you put it in practice. I mean, and that's in and that's like that's see to me. He, you know, I look at it and people say to me every day, they're like, Alexis, like America's dairy farmers and football players. Like, how does that happen? And I always say like, it's the most unlikely of uh, suspects. But I say that to you because I think that's what a consciously unbiased world looks like. Um, this is, a, these are two folks who at their core, from their fabric, they are so much alike. It's so interesting because Jimena's witnessed it. You know, you stand there with a farmer and you stand there with this like this big, you know, hulking football player, and you go, How do they get each other? And they they just they don't look at each other and judge each other because I'm 300 pounds and I'm an offensive lineman, or I'm a 150 pound farmer who works 24-7 and whether I'm picking up manure or I'm milking a cow, I'm any different. They look at each other with such an enormous amount of unconscious bias and they respect each other's heritage and values. And it's to me, that's the kind of world we want to live in. And that's the kind of world that Jimena is creating for us, right? And so it's so interesting listening to you guys and listening to kind of where we are and just thinking to myself, I'm a lucky kid. I'm kind of working with what I consider to be um, all of them, the leaders of today and the leaders of tomorrow, I just wish we could get more folks to understand that that natural unconscious, you know, that just to be there, um, to be to, to be around people who at their core understand the value and principles of what makes us different and why we should cherish that is so beautiful. And, um, and that's what's going to make um, all of this feel worth it if we can really create the change. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to leave you with one last question and then um, I hope we get, definitely get to do more things together. I'm so excited about the future. So Jimena, to start with you, what does consciously unbiased say to you? Consciously unbiased to me is, you know, putting aside every dis predisposition you can think of that you have and seeing a person for who they are. You know, I've already talked about this a little bit but it's checking yourself almost. It's making sure that, you know, you're not going into any situation or any scenario with any predispositions, making sure that you're completely impartial to either who you're meeting, who you're working with, 
or just going about your life. You know, it's being open and understanding to others, being open to different scenarios, cultures, situations, all anything really. And I think in that way, not only are you honoring other people's, you know, culture, their heritage, who they are, but you're also honoring the fact that, you know, we're all, we're all the same, really. You know, we're all in it together. We all depend on each other. You know, why not work together? Why not take advantage of every opportunity to get to know as many different people as you can? And that way, not only are you helping other people, but you're also helping yourself. You're helping yourself be a better person. You're helping yourself be more open-minded and really you're bettering yourself. You're bettering your heart. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I do I have to follow you. You know, <laughs> um, you know um, to me, un, uh, to me, consciously unbiased is beauty. And when I mean beauty, I mean I. You know, it's so interesting. I, I say to folks like, "Do we breathe the same way? Do we all have to eat to nourish our bodies? Do we see the same things in the world? Do we have eyes?" We have a lot of commonalities. We have tremendous commonalities, but we also have so many beautiful differences. And that's what makes us extraordinary. That's our beauty. I don't want us necessarily all to be the same. I want us to be different and I want us to embrace our differences. I think that is the beauty of who we are. We may breathe the same way. We may eat the same way. We may see things very similarly. But on the other hand, there are plenty of occasions where we see things differently or we look different or we aspire to do different things. And that's extraordinary. That's beauty. So to me, consciously unbiased means understanding each other's beauty, understanding each other's values and differences and embracing those and making them part of that great whole that Jimena was talking about. Because the, the beauty, right, of, of putting all these pieces together in a pie is that not everyone has to look exactly alike, but that pie when it's together is this richness of, of cultures and values and experiences and dreams and aspirations that makes up that big, beautiful heart she talked about. So to me, I just see beauty in it um, and I see unlimited potential. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. I'm definitely going to ask you to help us with this. Um, <laughs> have a wonderful day. And um, again, thank you so much for doing this with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you Bye. so much. <laughs>